So my name's Dan McCulloch. Uh, I'm a lecturer in criminology and social policy at the Open University and this morning's presentation is called Do Participatory Visual Methods Give Voice? So a little bit about the study. It's a National Centre for Research Methods funded project under the Innovation and Visual Methods stream and the project itself is called Do Participatory Visual Methods Give Voice? Um, it started in September 2017 and runs, in fact, now until the end of uh, March 2019 rather than February 2019 uh, due to a month extension for paternity leave. And it's split into three main phases. I'll come to talk about each of these phases in more detail as we go through. But this first phase looks at exploration of researcher, understandings of participatory visual methods and voice. The second phase uh, aims to evaluate participatory visual methods from a co-creator or participant perspective. And the third phase uh, looks at evaluating the visual output, so to speak, of participatory visual methods from the perspective of uh, audience groups. So the research questions for the project, um, there's one main central research question which is do participatory visual methods give voice? But this is then split into four sub-questions which aim to help answer this. So the first, how do researchers understand voice and in what ways do they understand participatory visual methods to give voice? Second, in what ways and to what extent do individuals living in poverty feel that visual representations created through participatory mapping reflect their voices? In what ways and to what extent are the maps created through participatory mapping accurately understood by practitioners as an audience group? And in what ways and to what extent are the maps created through participatory mapping accurately understood by members of local communities and the general public, again as a kind of audience group? And these questions will probably, hopefully, make more sense as I go through the presentation. So just a little bit of an overview of this first phase then, uh, which looks at researcher understandings. So this consists of a literature review that's ongoing that, and looks at academic and practitioner focused literature. Um, so uh, there's a, a body of acad academic literature um, on the topic, but also what's really come through in this literature is that there are lots of groups that are using uh, different types of methods that might be considered participatory visual methods as well. So it, it's important to look beyond academic literature in terms of this. Um, and really in looking at this literature review, what I'm trying to look at is, is uh, 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 papers around voice, methodological papers on participatory visual methods and, and some conceptual methodological considerations and also some of the specifics of how participatory visual methods have been used within projects. As well, there have been two workshops with researchers that have used participatory visual methods. So these took place in Milton Keynes in London and had 18 participants across the two workshops. The divide between the two is, is there, so five in Milton Keynes and 13 in London. And these were split into three main areas of discussion, which were what are participatory visual methods, what is voice, and is there a relationship between participatory visual methods and voice? So some of the literature on um, what participatory visual methods are. Um, I think, interestingly in the literature, the the literature, I think, is, is still developing in this area, um, but I think one of the interesting things is that there's not necessarily one clear definition of participatory visual methods that carries across the literature. So um, when I was putting in uh, the, the bid for this project, these were the two definitions that I used, and, and I think they raised some interesting questions about participatory visual methods. So this top one that suggests that it, this is approaches in which research participants are active in shaping the project as co-producers of visual knowledge. Um, and then the bottom one that says, though seldom defined or codified, the process often brings together an unfamiliar outside person and an individual group, uh, and an individual or group of inside people, so this relationship between outsiders and insiders, who use cameras, uh, still and video, to jointly explore a topic of shared concern. And I think this idea of cameras is an interesting one because then if we look at the literature on participatory visual methods and what might count as participatory visual methods, we see a much wider range of things and things that, that, that methods that might just make use of cameras. So, um, for example, 
kind of drawing techniques, um, techniques that might be drawn more from arts-based backgrounds as well, um, things like timelines, um, things like image theatre might, might go beyond some of these uh, ways of, of doing things that are spoken about within that bottom definition. And then some initial findings from the workshops um, where we spoke about what are participatory visual methods. One of the things that, that came out that I think is really interesting is that, and, and that I perhaps wasn't expecting, was that there were debates about where the boundary of the visual was. So some people spoke about this as being related to artifacts, visual artifacts, so photos, film, as, as kind of traditional visual techniques. But this wasn't necessarily clear cut, so people spoke about theatre as a, as a, a visual uh, method. Or the written text, if, if we're reading using sight, then people spoke about the visuality of text and that actually text can be presented in lots of different ways and, and there's an aesthetic quality to the way that we present text. And again, when we spoke about what does participatory mean, People spoke about this in some different terms, so I've, I've included some here, to be present, to engage, to contribute, is it about opportunities to tell a story? And, and then people started to question this thing of whether it's about the individual that's involved, or actually is it about external impact? To, to be a participatory method, does it need to have some form of external impact? And I think one of the other things that came out is that regardless of, of what we think participatory may or may not be specifically, individuals, researchers, are likely to have biases in what they think counts as good versions of participation. So what people prefer as a participatory approach might differ from individual person to person. And I think also one of the other things that came out, as, as E.J. Milne has, has uh, highlighted, is that non-participation might tell us something really important and interesting. So actually, when we're talking about participatory methods, non-participation is an important aspect of that to consider. And then we also spoke about some of the reasons why we might use participatory visual methods uh, in research. So Luke Powers talks about this idea of a communicative rationale for participatory visual methods, that the visual allows communication in ways that text may not. So the visual opens up different communicative avenues or possibilities. But people, again, kind of question this. So they said, well, OK, this may be true, but it's problematic to assume that the visual is more accessible, for example, as a communicative tool. Because just as we might need language to communicate verbally, we also rely on a visual language to communicate visually. So it's problematic to presume that everyone can just communicate visually. And there are also norms about what might be considered good visual data. So there are, there are aesthetic qualities to visual data that are kind of cultural or normative. And this has to be taken into consideration. What, what society or, or culturally is considered as a good visual is an important aspect of this. And, and one person in particular pointed to the fact that actually when as researchers we're thinking about good visual data and we might have biases about what we consider good visual data, this means that a whole host of things might be discarded. that are still visual data and might still tell us things that are very important. So they were talking in particular about some research where people kind of took visual data and left other things behind. What Mike Savage might refer to as the cutting room floor data, the stuff that gets discarded and kind of swept away. And then there's also the ethical rationale for using participatory visual methods. Some of these ideas, and, and these aren't all of the kind of justifications for this by any means, but that this might be about a recognition of people as experts in their own lives that it might be about bringing about a social change or a more democratic research process. But again, people questioned this a little bit and said, well, it's important to ask when participation is legitimate. So some people said that we might think about participation on a continuum. 
where at one side we might have quite uh, what people kind of um, in some cases referred to as a tokenistic form of participation. And on the other side, this might be a, a, a purest version of co-creation. So it's important to think through what we think is legitimate when we're talking about participation. And also about participation at different stages of the research process. So is this just about data collection? Or is this about the full research process? Is this about design? of research, analysis of data, dissemination of research findings. And then even in, within each element of these, there are different versions of participation that we might take. So these can vary hugely from consultation, co-development, it might be participant-led, or actually it might be a community-instigated and very community-driven approach, which, which would look very different potentially to one that's researcher-instigated. And then people spoke about whether there's a need for co-ownership of data and co-authorship of research findings. And that raises some, some difficulties and some tensions, as I'll come back to uh, later on. And this perhaps was best summarised in, in terms of thinking about these debates about where the participatory lies in a question where someone said, well, is YouTube participatory? And this led to a bit of discussion. Because people say, well, no, YouTube is a broadcast medium. Um, but then this person said, well, OK, but you can communicate. And you, you can have two-way communication because you can comment using YouTube. And then you can comment back. And then you can put up new videos. And this raises questions, I think, about what people will consider participatory. Because for some people, that wouldn't be participatory. For other people, it might very well be. And so I think what comes out of this is that we need to be aware of the relationship between particular tools, particular methods that we use, and the approaches that we use, and the relationships between them, and the, the links between them, but also that they potentially are different things, and we need to be aware of what we're doing with these different things. Also, I think something that really came out of this was that we probably need to be aware for what reasons we are using particular approaches, methods, and tools and what assumptions we're making when we're doing that. And in doing that, kind of acknowledging our own biases that are likely to be there when we're talking about participatory visual methods. So then looking at some of the, the literature on voice, and there's a, a big literature on this, so I've not, it's not possible to kind of talk to that all here, so I've tried to uh, include a few bits, but this is by no means a, a full literature. Uh, so Nick Coldry talks about this uh, voice as, as being potentially understood as both a process of giving an account of one's life and the world in which we act, and as a value. So this value that gives weight to ways of structuring society that allow for voice as this process. And in particular, voice that matters. And this kind of concept of voice that matters raises some, some interesting points as well. So this might be referred to as expressing one's own voice and being linked to the right to be heard. And Tiffany Ferry talks about this as being linked to the idea of listening. But also Pat Thompson talks about the idea and, and questions the idea of an authentic voice and says, well, there are different voices that we use when we're uh, involved in different things, when we're in different situations. So, she refers to the authoritative, critical, therapeutic, consumer and pedagogic voices. But we might also be able to think of others in terms of thinking about different sorts of voice that we use. And when we came to discuss this within the workshops and we said, OK, well, what is voice? This, these were the things that came up, meanings, beliefs, experiences, perspectives or opinions. And some people summarise this as uh, perhaps being linked to an expression of self, to tell one's story or perspective. And in thinking about this idea of, of voice and, and voices uh, being able to be communicated, people spoke about this being about both the message and the media that we choose to use, or the media that are available to us to communicate this voice. But I think one of the things that, that was important that came out of this is a recognition that voice is a socially constructed concept. 
actually when, when we're talking about this, we're not talking about sound or noise that, that might be very physical processes. Voice is something that, that is constructed for particular purposes and to allow us to talk about particular ways of doing things. And so people started to differentiate between the having a voice and making a sound, and in doing so, being listened to as, a spo as opposed to being heard, which is a very physical process, being listened to as a much more social process. And people also spoke about voice as a communicative process, and similarly to the visual, said that, well, this requires an ability to communicate using the required tools or language of telling and listening. There are normative ways of talking about stories and of communicating our voices. So again, it might be problematic to presume that everyone can communicate using these normative rules of structuring our own voices. And in doing so, we, we'd probably need to recognise the relationship between an internal, subjective voice and social norms that guide what we think of as, as uh, voices or narrative ways of, of creating voice. So it's important to recognise that, like the visual, voice has a language. And to be able to communicate in a way that might be seen as externally valid, we almost kind of need to know that code of expressing our voice. We also asked whether there was a clear way of measuring the presence or absence of voice. And, and some people suggested that actually if, if you read some of the literature, really the strongest suggestions about whether voice is present often comes from researchers themselves that are writing about the presence of voice. Um, and this leads to questions about whose voice is it that actually we're hearing when we're talking about this. And this leads on to questions perhaps about the validity of voice. When is voice valid? Where is voice valid? For whom is it valid? Is it time limited? Is it context dependent? And in thinking about this, the importance of recognising that the, the, the voices that, that if we're talking about uh, voices as valid, that voices might outlive research projects and potentially go beyond the researcher's control. And that might raise questions about whether, if that happens, whether voice is still valid. And also to think about recognisable voice. Is, is voice to, to be valid? Does it need to have an impact on audiences? And this also led to questions about research responsibility for voice. So there were suggestions that actually if we're heavily involved in the analysis and the dissemination processes, then this means that we can amplify some voices and silence others, especially if we have an editorial role. And we might do that to fit our own sense of what good voices are, or because we know an audience might be more inclined to pay attention to some forms of voice or some voices than others. And also that we need to be aware of the power relationships between different voices and actors within the research process. So we don't go in and these, these relationships haven't ever been there. They've, they've been there already, so we need to pay attention to these when we're thinking about the relationships between them and how we present them. And we also spoke about some of the ethical tensions in using participatory visual methods. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, some people asked whether there needs to be co-ownership of data to, for a method to be, or an approach to be truly participatory. But this raises some questions. What, what happens if someone wants to tell a particular story or produce a visual output? But as a researcher, you might know that that might have detrimental outcomes, either for that individual or perhaps for the group that, that might be taking part in this. Or that it, there might be things that this raises that are uncomfortable. Well, what duty do you have to that person, to the group, about some of these things? And also, there were questions about whether we should brief and train people on visual cultures and norms around voice and narrative structure. So there might be good justifications for either doing this or for not doing this. So there, there might be a justification that we do so that people are aware of these, but then we might be accused of directing or steering the data that's produced around what we feel to be good visual data. 
and that actually we're interfering too heavily. But on the flip side of that, if we don't, there are questions about what happens if we leave this and then a, a participant or co-creator of this then says, well, it had no external impact and I wanted external impact. Well, why didn't you tell me that this, that this was unlikely to have external impact? Or that actually, I'm not really happy with the type of data that's been produced from this. So I think some of the initial findings that have come out of this first phase are that there's a, a lack of consensus on what participatory visual methods are. And, and probably the best way to deal with this that people spoke about is to be clear on what our own biases are, what we're counting as participatory and visual, and to make that clear. And why we've chosen a particular approach and what assumptions we might be making when we're doing so. Also that voice has a language or code and that we as researchers have responsibility around voices and the claims we make about the validity of these voices. Um, I think potentially voice and participatory visual methods are, are potentially loaded terms. So it's important to, to unpick some of what we mean when we're talking about these because I think sometimes they can be used as a shorthand to indicate a particular approach, but then the details of what that means aren't always made clear. And then I think also it's important to recognise that, that people spoke about the tensions in what's in the best interests of those involved and why. Why we're taking particular decisions and why we think that's the right decision. So, the, moving on to talk about the, the second uh, phase, that should say phase two at the top there rather than phases two and three, um, which is about evaluation from those that are involved in research, either as participants or co-creators, depending on um, the approach that's being taken. Part two aims to uh, understand and evaluate from a, a participant perspective, and it aims to do this through uh, undertaking a participatory visual method and, and trying to evaluate that with the people that have been involved in doing so. Uh, so evaluation of the method, of the idea of voices as present within that, uh, of visual outputs and of audience understandings of visual outputs. And this is taking place in a, a local day centre um, for people living in poverty or experiencing homelessness in Northampton. It's a, uh, a day centre that I know well, have had uh, links with in the past. Um, and the initial proposal when I was putting this together was that this would be about participatory mapping of the local area. Actually, when I was talking to people about this, um, those that are involved kind of expressed a preference for methods that are much more auto-photography style methods um, rather than mapping methods, and, and instead about where, where they live rather than about the local area. And of course that could be a, a criticism of the, the project too, is that um, when I was putting the proposal together people weren't involved in co-creating that, so actually for some people this wouldn't be a a fully participatory project anyway. Um, I think they said actually the day centre's useful in some ways for them, but that they don't necessarily associate or um, affiliate with the area necessarily as much as they would want to talk about the area where they live. And I think that what's come out so far in this second phase are, are that there are considerations throughout the research process. So these aren't all of the considerations, and some of them I'm still trying to uh, whirl around in my head. Um, but that there are uh, uh, considerations throughout the research process. So before the re research begins, tensions in institutional and funder expectations, um, and quite often, particularly at an institutional level, um, there might be a, a desire for precision, uh, particularly where we're kind of talking about things like uh, institutional uh, ethics review panels and things like that that want to know precisely what you're going to be doing and who's going to be involved and how that's going to be managed. And of course, when some of these things are a little bit less uh, kind of nailed down, they're not necessarily always uh, too favourable to that. That 
there are considerations in approaching services and talking to services if you're planning to talk to a service involved. Um, and that also there are questions about well, how do you deal with the idea that people might not want to be involved, um, which, which I think is, uh, well, I say poss probably inevitable. It might not be inevitable, but that some people might not want to be involved in things. Also, that there are considerations in setting out research. Uh, so, this idea of what do you do during a briefing? Um, how far should the researcher be involved or steer a project? Um, how do you deal with consent as a, as a process, as an ongoing process? Um, and, and I think one of the things that, that's really come out is, is being clear on the limits of researcher power, and I'll come back to that. And then during the research, thinking about participatory approaches as they develop and that they're kind of potentially moving things so they might shift as they're ongoing and, and there's an element of, of working through things as they happen. Um, consent throughout that as an ongoing part of, of the research process and an ethic of care for participants, this kind of thing of well, what considerations do you make around um, ethics processes and in particular related to care of participants. Then also considerations in, in audiencing, in, in, in disseminating, uh, so planning who the audience will be, how to present visual outputs, decisions about editing, who will edit, how to edit, what will be edited, and whether you include uh, verbal data as part of these. There are questions about whether the visual as a standalone uh, works in producing voice, and, and so that's an important consideration. And then I think even after research, there are, are things that are considerations. So the ongoing relationships um, and, and the ongoing existence of visual outputs and visual data after the research project, the potential for misappropriation of images and actually the, the, the idea that the researcher might not always be able to manage what happens with those images or with those voices that come out of things. So there are questions about what happens with that. And I think also one of the things that, that constantly comes up is this idea of potential tensions in the relationship, uh, and this might depend on the method that you're using or the approach that you're using, but, but between the collective different groups and individuals within this and managing those, that sometimes what an individual might want might differ from a kind of collective group or, or groups within that. So some initial findings from this second phase. Um, there are, uh, so far, uh, I think people involved have spoken about some of the ways in which participatory visual methods have been useful. Uh, so they've spoken about uh, the, the perceived impact on audiences of visual um, outputs. They, they, they have spoken about the visual and its communicative ability compared to verbal data, which I think is interesting. Uh, this idea that it's a different sort of language. And they've spoken about this kind of method as a different method from a semi-structured interview. And the people involved in, in this research have often been involved in different forms of interviewing in terms of uh, when they approach services and things like that. So, so they are aware of uh, what might be a service entry interview and have uh, experience of that. But equally, some people haven't been interested in this project and have spoke about the idea of, of uh, this method as infantilizing. Some people have suggested that actually they just don't like working with visuals. Some people have said that they, they can't use the technology or don't want to use the technology. And um, one person has said that they, they did a, a previous uh, uh, thing of this sort and didn't enjoy it. And so I think this raises questions about whether particular participant attributes or skills are necessary to be involved in particular projects, or even if they're not necessary, whether people uh, themselves um, perceive them to be necessary. That actually in using methods that might be familiar or methods that are new, there might be benefits or difficulties that either using a familiar or a new method raise. And I think one of the other things that this brings up is that the, the research, uh, the, the projects that we do, 
ha might have a lasting impact on the people that are involved beyond our own project. So they, there, there might be a responsibility that we bear both to those people that are involved and also to other people that might be using these sorts of methods in the future because, of course, it, it might affect people that, that are approaching these in the future. And then the third phase, uh, which will be about evaluation from audiences, this, this phase hasn't actually kind of taken place yet, um, but this is likely to be an audience of service providers, invited members of the public, um, particularly invited by those involved, and possibly other members of the public, but, but this audience group will be decided um, largely from those that are involved in phase two, um, so the people that are involved in, in, in uh, their auto photography. And this aims to look at audience groups' understanding of images, whether they think voice is present within these, and this will be fed back into the evaluation um, from participants in phase two. But I think there are some limitations to this project. Um, I think there's a, a wider thing about when asking the question, well, do participatory visual methods give voice? Well, certainly in, the, in this second and third phase, this is one project. It's not going to provide answers for every single project. Um, it's a specific approach to a participatory visual method. And, and of course, it has particular ways of thinking about participation, time, who takes part and who doesn't, visual outputs, audiencing. And like any of these projects, I think there are some tensions involved that require trade-offs. And this, that's true of this project, and, and that will inevitably affect the findings that come from it. I think also when, when we're talking about evaluation, there are decisions in the evaluation process that make a difference, as well as a method that's used. There are things about whether we're talking about individual or group in, uh, evaluation or a combination of those. But also, I think one of the things that comes through in evaluation, particularly when we're talking about a concept like voice, is that there might be a very different way of thinking or, or a different uh, evaluation that comes from an evaluation where I say this is a concept of voice that I'm talking about let's talk about evaluation of that so if I say well what what do you understand by voice and then how do we evaluate that so that that inevitably makes a difference and I think this kind of raises a question about whether voice is a, a is a kind of jargony concept uh, that we make use of because it, it does some things for us but actually one of the things particularly that's come through in this second phase is that even when I'm talking to people about voice it's kind of a, a, a vague term in some ways to some people so there are some uh, outputs from the project currently available um, there's a methods news article on the R NCRM website and there's a podcast um, on the NCRM website. There's also a project uh, website and there are social media feeds from the project. And the future plans for the project are that there will be... Yeah, sorry. Okay. And there are some planned um, activities and outputs from the project for the future. So the website and social media feeds will host updates on the project. Um, there'll be an NCRM briefing paper on the findings from the research, as well as journal articles. Um, and I plan to hopefully produce a, a toolkit of considerations for people using participatory visual methods. And, and the idea with this is that it would be something that would be critiqued to allow for it to be developed further. I'm not suggesting that it would answer all of these questions, or indeed that it might answer any of these questions well. Actually, if it turns out that what it does is raise things that are problematic and then people critique it, and then it's developed further, I'm more than happy with that. 
Um, and, and so I hope to present this at an event for researchers to start a network around these themes towards the end of the project. So the intended kind of um, impacts that I hope to have from the project are that I hope that this contributes to a conversation around decisions and the considerations that we make when, understand, uh, when undertaking uh, research that involves participatory visual methods and to encourage a, a kind of openness and honesty about the approach that we take to research and to discuss the details of these decisions. In some cases this is done very well, I'm not suggesting that this isn't done at all. But of course in other cases participatory visual methods can be used as a shorthand to indicate something that really isn't necessarily always discussed in detail. So I think that this might talk about the forms of participation taken, details of what we mean by participatory, a recognition of the limits and trade-offs um, made during the research process and their implications for the data that's produced, uh, and definitions of voice, how we understand voice and how we're using voice or utilising voice within our, the projects that, that we uh, are involved in. Uh, and that's all, all I've got to present. I'm happy to take any questions. And here are kind of the links to the website, social media. And that's my email address if you want to get in touch with any comments, questions, um, or anything like that. So thank you very much. <laughs>